Okay, we're back, we're live, we're Think Tech doing back to school, raising public awareness, especially about Kaka'ako. We have been talking with uh, Scott Wilson of the AIA in the past hour about uh, urban design in Kaka'ako, and we only began that conversation. Yeah. Feels like we have miles and hundreds of miles to go. We do. Okay, that, that's the sound of Scott Wilson. Say hi to the people again. Hello, everybody. Okay, and now from, is it Seattle, uh, Catherine? Yes, it is. Uh, we have K with Kathy Vandenbrink. Catherine, Catherine Vandenbrink. <laughs> She's with ArtSpace, and she joins us by Skype from Seattle. A little while from now, we'll have Naomi Chu, who is also with ArtSpace, uh, for another part of this show, and she will join us by Skype Sound. Uh, from, uh, I guess, where is she now? She's in Minneapolis, is it? Yes. Okay. Anyway, so um, this is all about Kaka'ako. The world comes together in Kaka'ako. But you guys in art space have been doing tons of stuff around the country. And we want to know more. We want to know everything about art space. What is art space and what is your mission, Catherine? Art space's mission is to create, foster, and preserve affordable space for artists and arts organizations. Very simple. Does that mean that if I'm an, a, an art lover, I can get some affordable space? Or do I have to be a legitimate, full-tilt, boogie artist? Well, you know, here's what we do in each community that we work in. We create a committee of artists that's diverse, different disciplines, different ages, different ethnic backgrounds. And that committee is the one who works with us to create a definition of artists that, that's appropriate for that community. So give us a, a, an, an example, if you will, of an art space project that you've either recently built or are now building on the mainland. Sure. Um, well, I'm based in Seattle, and we just are, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be completing our third project here. And this project, was we were asked by the city and the transit authority to build a project right next to a light rail station. And that project mm -hmm. is going to open in about a month and that will have 57 units of affordable housing for artists and their families, mm -hmm. studios, one bedrooms and three bedroom units, and about 12 spaces on the ground floor for arts related businesses. But what would that be? I can think of an art gallery, an art supply store, I can yeah, you know, it's, it's again, it's kind of a broad definition because we look for organizations and businesses that serve the community, that respond to the community. So in this particular project, we have a Vietnamese English dual language daycare that will be in part of oh, the units. Perfect. We have a West African artist that's opening a gallery that will serve West African artists, and he will be doing workshops in his space. We have um, a capoeira dance company that will be moving into that one of those spaces. We have an organization called Urban Wilderness that uses um, the arts and wilderness experience to connect inner city youth with nature. Uh, let's see, we have a bike shop, cafe shop. Perfect. Um, kind of those kind. Those are the kinds of businesses. We have two other galleries: a gallery for uh, a disabled artists that are mostly blind artists. We are close to a lighthouse for the blind. So uh, how does this work, you know, like economically, because especially, I mean, I'm thinking of Honolulu, but I mean elsewhere where you've developed the model in other places. Yeah. Uh, how, how can you afford to build a condo building and build out retail space and act like a regular commercial, mm -hmm. you know, developer and landlord, so to speak? Um, and make everything affordable for everybody. How, how do you do? Do you have <coughs> you have um, a special nonprofit characterization or what? What do you do? Well, we do, but um, you know the basic tool that we use in all of our projects, and that many many low income housing providers across the country use, is the low income housing tax credit program. Ah. That is federally, it's federal money that comes through a tax credit and is administered by each state. So you are awarded tax credits based on the population of your state. And then there is a state entity that 
puts out a an application process that then developers, both private and nonprofit developers, can access those funds through that application process. And that that will be the bulk of the funding for the project. So, so what the entity ArtSpace? What kind of an entity is that? Arts, oh, I'm sorry. ArtSpace is a nonprofit. We are we have been a nonprofit and operating for about. 30 years. We started out as an organization that was simply trying to help artists find space in Minneapolis, St. Paul. When we found that artists would keep coming, the same artists would come back after six, six months or a year and say, you know, my building got developed or got sold and now my rent's going way up. I can't afford it. What can I do? How can you help me? And we realized after about five years of operating this way that we needed to own property. We needed to have property that we controlled and could get the funding for and know that we could commit to affordability and perpetuity to allow those artists to stay and be in those communities that they help create. Why, why am I driven to a vision of La Boheme and Mimi <laughs> and Rodolfo living in the garret? above the streets you know, of Paris. Why, why do I think of that? It's so interesting that you should say that, Jay, because I think that we, you know, we really have some myths about artists. Very, very few artists in our, in our culture make a living from their work. Most artists are out in the communities working full or part-time jobs, doing in offices, hospitals, schools, restaurants, bars to support the creative work that they do. They come back to their studios, do that creative work, and provide all of us with this rich environment that we get to appreciate. Yeah. I, I uh, grew up, I mean, I mean, uh, grew, grew aware, I would say, in uh, the life in Greenwich Village in the 60s, you know, the, the beat generation. Right. And uh, there were many, many, many art, art, art uh, examples of artists and art activities in those days in that place. I mean, not only uh, the fine arts, but, uh, you know, the, uh, en the entertainment and the performing arts. Um, but, uh, and I wondered, uh, you know, did, were you a founder of this? It sounds like you were, Catherine. <laughs> were you there no, when I it was started? Did you, no, did I you... was not. Um, Kelly Lindquist is our president, and he is the founder of ArtSpace and is still the president of ArtSpace. Now, I came um, to learn about ArtSpace through activism in my community in Seattle and brought ArtSpace to town to help us preserve artist spaces and ended up, you know, went from my studio, working in my studio, to developing buildings. Well, I want to ask you one other thing, and then I'd like to broaden the conversation sure. uh, to include Scott Wilson. But uh, uh, that is that, you know, do you perceive through your activities with ArtSpace that something is happening in the country, uh, that there is a, a growing generation, if you will? I mean, I call the current generation Kakaako Special K. <laughs> no, no relation to Kellogg's. Um, and... Uh, you know, do you perceive that there's something happening that makes your model all the more attractive and interesting and, uh, you know, in, in demand, so to speak, at this time in the country's development? No, Jay, I'm really, I'm glad you said that because I, I see two big things that are happening. One is when we started out, I mean, we come and work in communities where we're invited. And it used to be it was artists that invited us. More and more, we are invited by mayors, by city council members, by economic development folks within a city government. They are seeing the arts as a crucial part of how they want their city to develop and how it how it's reflects out to the greater community and to people coming to visit. So I think that's a big change. The other big change that I'm really excited about is when I meet the many, many young artists that live in our buildings and they're in the communities that we work in, you know, in my generation, we kind of diligently worked in our studios and waited for an, a gallery owner to come and tap us on the shoulder and say, you're good enough, we're going to show your work now. And that doesn't seem to be the case now. I see young artists getting out there, 
finding their own venues, creating their own venues, supporting one another, collaborating with one another, and really approaching this from a whole different place to bring, and I think Kaka'ako is a great example of that, the arts organizations that are working there, Pow Wow Hawaii, 808 Urban, their Fresh Cafe, Fish Cake, Box Jelly, there's all kinds of activity there that comes from out of that excitement and collaboration and initiative. Well, you know what, uh, just to uh, j- make me think of uh, the uh, Pacific New Media Art Exhibition, which was conducted in a gallery here in Bishop Square, which is downtown. It's not all that close to Kaka'ako. It's in sort of next neighborhood over uh, in, in the Andrew Rose Gallery. And it's a little wee gallery of maybe, I don't know, 500 feet size of our studio. Um, and there were like thousands of people who wanted to come to this art exhibition. I'd never seen anything like it. I, and I concluded myself that something was happening here, that everybody wants to be part of the, the new art, um, in, at least in Honolulu. It, it reminded me of Madison Avenue. It did. And, you know, the cheese and the wine and the whole thing was like out of another time. And I, and I feel that there's a, there's a pent-up market for this. But let me, uh, let me shift to uh, Scott. Scott Wilson is working on policies and design ideas uh, that, that are relevant in the development of Kaka'ako, and I'm sure he is really interested in what you are doing. So what's your thought? Where does this fit, Scott? Where does art space fit in your perception of the, the way Kaka'ako should go? Well, uh, yeah, Catherine, it's nice to talk to you, even if uh, you may not be able to see me. But... Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, having a having a 26 year old uh, daughter who just graduated with a BFA in printmaking, I can attest to the difficulty of being an artist in today's world. Uh, it's it in some ways it seems almost harder to be a pure artist than it did in the 60s and the 70s. Um, I think there were lots of little neighborhoods in our cities that were kind of run down and that artists could live in. Even Greenwich Village at one time oh, was, sure. a, was kind of a, a, a dowdy place and, and that's why artists went there. Heck, Manhattan is completely off limits for artists now. They all, yeah. they fled to, Brit- to Brooklyn yeah. and now Brooklyn's too expensive. <laughs> so um, I think you, I applaud uh, ArtSpace for being pragmatic enough to, to recognize the, the, the financial difficulties that artists face and to try to really get in on the ground level and say, we are going to help you on a long-term basis. Um, and um, well, we were talking last hour about you know this this whole flow of people and uh, the sort of the engagement of the community together, connection of the community, yeah. and finding really interesting things to do and cafes and restaurants and you know sort of watching and being watched and the European experience. And it strikes me that art's, art is part of that. Um, it's, you know, it's the kind of thing where you get up on a Sunday morning and take your, your favorite other and go down and, you know, and buy some art. Uh, take a look and see what the artists are doing. Get creative and you know, do something completely lovely that way. Mm-hmm. And somehow this has a role in it for me. Mm-hmm. Jay, could I speak just to a moment to what's different about an art space building? I think it's it's really important to note that when we decided to create artist housing, it was really about three three things. One was a sense of community with the artists in the building and giving artists an opportunity to have critical mass and have an impact on the greater community. Uh, second was this space has got to truly be artists usable. So the, we build spaces that are larger than a standard low-income housing unit would be. So it is can be 150 to 200 feet square feet larger. Mm-hmm. One bedrooms are about 800 square feet. So in an open floor plan, so everything kind of revolves around as much open space as possible. So an artist coming in can, maybe they're going to use their bedroom as a studio. Maybe they need, maybe the 
the everything, the, all the living area will be in the bedroom and the living space will be wide open for dance or other kinds of rehearsals. It's really about, you know, durable surfaces, no rugs. It's about a space that's as open and simple and Volume is what we look for. We have 10-foot ceilings in all of our new construction to really, truly have a space where people can live and be creative. And then the third thing I'd say is we've, we've found that it, how important that commercial space is on the ground floor. That, I, I mean, when you talk about Greenwich Village in New York and and Kaka'ako and these neighborhoods that are that Kaka'ako I hope gets there where every block has something interesting going on it's the Jane Jacobs theory of you you keep going from one shop to the next we find that smaller spaces with a diverse diverse kinds of businesses that are not chains. We don't we don't have chain stores in our projects. We look for new businesses, we look for young entrepreneurs, we look for organizations, all kinds of people that contribute to the community that they're in and care about that community and give the residents upstairs an entree to the community as well. So many of the businesses that are in our ground floor employ the residents upstairs. There's a lot of cross fertilization. I hope your project is big enough to support all the people that will want to get into it. Actually, mm -hmm. Catherine. <laughs> well, that's why we did three here in Seattle. <laughs> the first was so popular, and the second one was so popular that we have a thousand people on our waiting oh, list, and God. everyone in the city was so thrilled with these projects that they wanted another. Oh, good for you. Yeah. That is great. Bravo. That really is. Bravo. That, that, that's that's, that's that great news. <laughs> that is great news. We need you. We need you in Honolulu, in so, Chicago. Scott, what about this idea about limiting, I love this idea, limiting retail to small retail, keeping the nationals out. I mean, this, this flies, uh, you know, contra to the, mm -hmm. the natural economics, you know, I mean, because mm -hmm. landlords love to have national tenants. They're more responsible on paying the rent. They pay higher rents. They have all their systems are worked out. They, they know how to do the gross. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, they 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 undermine uh, what Catherine and well and all of us are talking about. How do you how do you achieve the model that Catherine's talking about? Not only in the art space building, but all through Kakaaka. That's interesting, uh, Catherine. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, point that we we don't really want big box in in uh, I think it's going to be largely solved though by the very the, by the very uh, shape and design of these projects because these projects all have these podiums, uh, forty feet high podiums that kind of pretty much go to the sidewalk on all four sides. But the inner core is is parking and is a, is a structure of the of the tower above. So basically, whatever retail you have is going to be sort of thin, uh, sort of shallow and linear along a street. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, that sounds like something that's not going to work for a Walmart. They're, they want they want something that's a uh, 300 feet by 300 feet. Well, they're not going to be able to get it. Uh, the all of these projects. Uh, have pretty much the same form, which is a podium base, a tower, a residential tower. So, so by their their very design, they discourage really big retail space. But what about what about um, you know? I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Milan. Forgive me. Uh, in Milan, there's this fabulous shopping area. You see this everywhere. Uh, I saw this in Istanbul not too long ago too, and all over all over Asia, where it's an inside kind of walkway mm -hmm. and the shops are not on the outside or well, not only on the outside mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. the best shopping is inside you walk in and mm -hmm. there's a whole crisscross of uh, pathways and mm -hmm. hallways and lots of little shops <coughs> and they're open you know the roller doors go up mm -hmm. and everybody is selling something um, is this is this not happening in Kaka'ako and Catherine yeah. what do you think I mean is this consistent with your model are you going to have inside shops in art space? Um, we will not. We Our parking, like you said, our parking will be on the inside, not visible to the exterior. We will, um, the, other, the other piece of this project that's very interesting is we have a local partner, Vicki Takamini, who oh, has sure. a 
yeah. Foundation, Pai Foundation. Everyone knows her, yeah. Yes, I know. And she will have a large space on the ground for, floor for her halal, for a gallery for Native, Ameri Native Hawaiians. And this will add a, a major cultural piece to the project. We will then have another portion of commercial space on the opposite side of the building that will be smaller spaces, maybe 500 square, three, four, 500 square foot spaces for smaller businesses. Okay. But the, um, but the what, issue, what, you know, Jay, I think the real issue there is you can have those small spaces and it still depends on the price per square foot, whether sure. it's affordable to new businesses. Sure. Well, whatever, you know, and I suppose one thing that Scott mentioned earlier, and that is the canopy. If you have, mm -hmm. if you have a canopy, as, and Honolulu is not, you know, is not stranger to canopy. We have yeah. canopies everywhere. Uh, if you have a canopy extending out from the building over the sh the, sh the front of the shop, Over the front, you right. achieve this kind of cover effect. Mm -hmm. sort of and like maybe that's China, something China like an tone. indoor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, um, I, have, you, have you both been to Night Market? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I was blown away. It was the biggest crowd I've seen since I've been coming to Honolulu. It was so exciting during um, Pow Wow. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I, I worry about Night Market, actually. I, I worry about the Eat the Street program, too. You, you know the one I'm talking about, the food trucks? Yes. Um, and, you know, there was lots of space for them to be out in the middle of Kaka'ako with a vacant, huge, big, vacant lot. Yeah. Now well, they're relegated uh, for Night Market to Cook Street there, which, I mean, it works for, yeah. for a time. I, I, hope they, I hope they continue. Uh, what's her name? Pony well, now, Askew. Runs Night that. Market is an internal market, right? That's the one that's in a big kind of a warehouse barn kind of feel. Partially. It's yeah. partially in that, the warehouse port portion, but when I was there, it was also out on the street. Yeah, out yeah, on Cook I, Street. It, both. You're right. It, yeah. It's in both. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and that's the Kamehameha School's idea to, you know, to build out uh, some open spaces in the mm -hmm. bays of that old warehouse building on yes. Cook Street. And then also to spill out into into Cook Street, and they, when I was there last, I mean, they just said no parking. I wondered how that happened, you know. I wonder if they do that mm -hmm. for me. But anyway, <laughs> no parking anywhere in Cook yeah. Street, and then they had uh, they had the stands and whatnot. It was like the Italian festival, and <laughs> if you've ever been to that. But um, everybody drives to it, unfortunately. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. This is yeah. I think Kamehameha Schools is to be is to be congratulated because they are attempting to build that urban culture, that yeah. urban neighborhood culture. Yeah. Uh, and they have they put their money where their mouth is. I mean, they they really put set aside buildings and and encouraged small artists and small organizations to create these these alternative, you might say, um, forms of uh, urban life. Yeah, it's really remarkable mm. what's happening. I mean, here you take a completely dud neighborhood, dud neighborhood, mm. nothing going on, tumbleweed, and all of a sudden now it has a culture. And, and arguably the culture is a special Hawaii culture. Yeah. Arguably the culture is an art culture. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's young people, it's the special K generation. Yeah. It's, it, hasn't, it actually hasn't settled down yet. It's in the process it, now, which, which brings me to the thought actually, Catherine, that what you do in art space is, you know, it's like you're going to have a big effect on this because it's still uh, a culture finding its way. Mm -hmm. It's finding its own characteristics. And what well, you I do will, ha will have secondary effect. I think what we can do is add stability to that, permanent stability and affordability to that, all of that activity that's happening in Kaka'ako now. Yeah. We're, we're very good. I, I think uh, you're, you're right to uh, uh, address the affordability issue because Kakako, this is like one of the number one concerns of, of all community groups is affordability. They, they hear the lip service about affordable housing and affordable commercial rents, but what they see getting built is by and large um, is, is market housing and market, uh, market retail. And that that's just beyond the reach of arts organizations. Yeah, that's an interesting possibility, Catherine. In other words, you create uh, creative value, you create art, and you have people who are creating art as, as a way of life and stores that are selling it, and that's affordable. But you're the only, I want to say, a model like that in town, 
And across the street from you are the $2 million condominiums. Yes. Of people who don't live here, you know, who mm. it's a corporate retreat maybe. Um, and so query exactly, I don't know if you have any idea of the answer to this, but, but exactly who will patronize those artists? Who will patronize the retail stores? Will it be the, the special K generation? Or, at the end of the day, will it be the big bucks guys who come once in a while and own the $2 million condos across the street? <laughs> well, I, think, yeah, I think there's going to be a, ren a renaissance, Jay. I think there is going to be a whole new sensibility about participating in your neighborhood and enjoying the small businesses in your neighborhood and, the, and, and it, being part of that neighborhood and connecting through the arts, through food, through culture. I like to think that as Kaka'ako grows, it's it's going to be tough. There's there's huge growth coming. I, I just, this last visit, went to the Howard Hughes kind of design center and saw what's coming and what's planned. And that's, that's going to have big challenges to get, to feel a sense of community from those giant high rises. When we talk to our our folks who apply for our building, they talk about how they want to live in an art space building because they've been to visit them and they see that everybody knows their neighbors, they know who live in their building, they communicate, they do things together, and that hasn't been their experience in larger apartment complexes. Well, I think people are going to copy you. <laughs> but you want to say something, Scott. Uh, no, I, I, I applaud you. Uh, I was, I was going to say, actually, uh, Kevin, you'd be, you'd be intrigued that in the, in the two, early 2000s, the mayor at the time, Jeremy Harris, actually totally revisioned uh, Kakako to be just six to ten stories, and it would, wow. be, it would be high density, but it was really more of a European model. And I think your art space building, I don't know the exact height of it, but it, it emulates more that European style where there's density, but it's not this massive high rise that uh, becomes alienating. You know, no one, no one loves to live in an in a elevator bound tower as much as they would like to live in a six story walk up where they can see their neighbors and, and socialize, but uh, not feel just completely uh, sort of alienated. So, well, Catherine, how, how big is the building going to be, and what's seven affordable? Seven stories. Rate? We're seven stories, seven shy stories. of 100 feet tall. Um, and that that's really important to us, is that connection to the street and to, to have activities and things happen. We have a, a big community room in all of our buildings. And in this project, on the second, on the top of that podium, we have about 10,000 square feet of green space. So we, um, it's not public space per se, but it is space that both the commercial and the residential tenants can program that space to invite the public in for events. Mostly it's used for rehearsals, events, fundraisers, things like that, but it's, it's about connecting the artist community with the community outside. But I, I agree with what you say about that, um, the high rise thing. I live on the, in a condo on the fifth floor of a building in Chinatown International District in Seattle. And there is such a difference between being on a floor where you can still see the expression on someone's face on the sidewalk. <laughs> it, I just appreciate that so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, that's a. It, it, it's just a disturbing. Uh, it's an argument that that kind of went back and forth in Honolulu, but I I, I strongly suspect the developers uh, may had the final word, and they mm. like to go high rise. Uh, yeah. In terms of construction, they can just squeeze these four hundred foot towers up. And it's and it's a it's a it's very cost effective. Yeah. Uh, and the, and the, the difference between uh, you know a an art space building and one of those big towers in terms of profit. Yeah. Huge, huge. Yeah. So one well, last question, also, Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just was going to say we also have to appreciate environmentally that this is building space up in the air and not taking up valuable land as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one last question, Catherine. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I suspect Scott feels the same way about it. You can't do this soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
So Amen. how soon are you going Development to do it? Development doesn't happen fast in, in Hawaii. We're, we're learning that. Yeah, we're we outsiders. <laughs> um, no, we've been working very hard and had um, amazing, you know, everywhere we've, we've gone, everyone we've talked to has been so supportive and so helpful and, you know, guiding us through the maze of just the development process there. Um, we are, we have a, what we feel is a very competitive application in to HHFTC, the entity that uh, makes that decision. And we should know very soon if we have an award of tax credits for this next year. If that's the case, we will still have some fundraising to do. One of the things that um, we do that other developers don't is we tap into foundations and arts related um, grant pr opportunities to bring that extra dollars into the project to create the volume that we create. So we um, will be working in the community. We have brought about a little over a million dollars of Ford Foundation money to Honolulu for this project. We have the Atherton Family Foundation has contributed 200,000. We continue to meet with community folks to see where those other funds will come from. All told, if we do our job and get everything done, we will hope to close on the property and start construction the second half of 2015. Well, that's and it's great. About a 16 month construction process. You're going to be out here in the interim? I, yes, of course. I, I do want to also mention our fabulous architects, Urban Works and Weinstein AU. Urban Works has their offices in Kaka'ako yes. and very mm -hmm. dedicated folks to the community. Really has been fabulous working with them. That's great. Well, when you're out here, Catherine, we, we have to get you on the show in person. Oh, that'd be great. I'd love and, it. And uh, looking forward to that. Let's take a short break and let's see if we can do some technology and get uh, you and Naomi on at the same time, okay? <clears throat> Great. <clears throat> we'll be, uh, this is Kath Catherine Vandenbrink of Artspace and uh, Scott Wilson uh, of the AIA Honolulu. This is Jay Fidel. We're talking about uh, raising public awareness about design in Kaka'ako. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host, together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Rafi. Every week I'm right here at Think Tank Hawaii, 3 p.m. on Mondays. My show is Boards as Bio Briefings. What do we do here? Well, we watch sperm swim, we see if they catch anybody, we check out the latest biosimilars, you know, the kind that, uh, what was his name, the guy with the bicycle? Uh, I guess we forgot his name, but he was taking EPO and other human growth factors. We'll be talking about human growth factors. You want to know where to get some? Maybe I'll tell. Anyway, you can catch me, as I said, every week right here. Monday, 3 p.m., Think Tech Hawaii, Dr. Rafi. You can also find me on Twitter, BioInfo Medical. Or you can catch me on Facebook, Dr. Rafael Boritzer. I'll be happy to converse with you. Aloha. I'm Jake Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas.
things out on the table so maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you think? I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy, we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people <laughs> and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Okay, it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. See you okay, here we are. We're back. We're live. We're back to school with Think Tech, raising public awareness about uh, urban design in Kaka'ako with uh, Scott Wilson. We started it with him at 2 o'clock. <laughs> he <laughs> stayed here. around because he was so <laughs> interested in our discussion with Art Space. Uh, Scott is um, the chair of the Regional and Urban Design Committee of the AIA and the president-elect of AIA Honolulu. And on, on Skype from Seattle, we have uh, Catherine Vanderbrink. Uh, she's with Artspace, and Artspace is a national company um, that's doing, among other projects, a wonderful project here in Honolulu uh, with Vicki Holt Takamini. Um, and it's going to have all kinds of art in it from one end to the other, and we're sort of learning about this project and and I feel it's kind of it's a it's a lightning rod for the whole area because what matters is not a big expensive condo what matters are the projects and the retail and the activities that have heart in them that attract people from you know other neighborhoods in Honolulu that 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 make that make the place come alive then there's no place I can think of that would do that more than a, a special affordable unit affordable retail art space like you have. So, you know, it's almost like we should pay you money to do this, Catherine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's about, challenging. What? It's, it's, very, it's very challenging. And, you know, the finding, as you know, resources for affordable housing are very difficult and very competitive. And there are many, many, many folks who need affordable housing. So we're, we're very aware that this is just one constituency that is getting having their needs met. There are many, 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 many more. Yeah. Well, what, um, what, what does affordable mean? Can you give us a range on what that means in, you know, the definition of this project? Sure. Um, you know, the, the tax credit program is um, operated by the IRS, so it's a federal federal program, and it is very specific about how someone income qualifies. The housing provided has to be for people making less than 60% of the area median in income, and that area median income is determined by HUD for different regions and areas of the country. For, I did my homework and I have the numbers for Honolulu, a single person would be earning less than $40,260 per year. Now the housing that we're going to provide will be 30%, 50%, and 60% of area median income. So we will have some units for people, a single person earning less than twenty thousand one hundred and fifty a month, uh -huh. that also translates into a four-person household earning less than twenty-eight thousand seven hundred or fifty thousand fifty-seven thousand four hundred and eighty for a sixty percent unit. Now, the rents for those units would be a one-bedroom at sixty percent of the area median income would be. One thousand seventy-eight dollars mm -hmm. for about eight hundred square feet. So that's uh, just a little over a dollar per square foot. Um, I would guess that the rental market is closer to two to three dollars per square foot in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. the is that, is that 30, the gross rent? I mean, or is there? Yes, uh, that's a gross rent. And and the what 30, about operating expense for the project? Do you? That's yeah, all in our pro forma. That's okay. all part of, yeah, that's part of the project. I we, think you're going to have a huge waiting list, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, the 30% units are 539 a month. Yeah, yeah, I think Ooh. you're going to have a huge waiting list. Um, but that's wonderful. And, and the question comes, I mean, as we kind of touched on this before, is how, how can you, is it in time only, or, or how do I qualify? Do I, is there a committee that uh, sees the value uh, sees whether I'm a legitimate artist or performer? Uh, 
How yeah, do you make that? That's a hard decision when you have thousands of people who will, by definition, be interested in these units. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that process. We're just right in the middle of it now with our third project in Seattle. Um, for In most instances, we conduct a an application process that's first come, first served. So the reason we do that is because often when we work in communities, we want to make sure that that community that we're working in are the artists that are served. So in some, some places, we are asked to do a local preference, which in Santa Cruz, we committed to 50% of the units would go to Santa Cruz County residents. In East Harlem, 50% of the units will go to artists currently living in East Harlem. Um, in the first come, first serve, it's funny because we, we do this and sometimes people line up overnight, sometimes people come early in the morning, and they all kind of start out with that idea of, oh God, I can't believe I have to wait in line for this, this is so hard. And everyone that we've interviewed for this project has said how the waiting in line started the community. They met the people that were going to be their neighbors. So interesting. They were, they, it was just amazing. It, I just In Santa Cruz, we had people camped out two days in advance, and they set up a tent city and had a band play and showed movies and said that they were going to repeat it every, every year. They were going to have an annual camp out in honor of that event. Um, so the first come, first serve process starts, and people put put their applications in, and the management company that is well versed in tax credit regulations, the management company then does the income qualification process, and once someone passes through that and background checks and all of that, the other kind of rental stuff, then they come to us, and that person is referred to us, and we do the artist selection process. And that's where we have the committee members come and do the interview. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat suddenly went dry. Do the interview and talk about, you're asked to, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to get water. My throat completely. Excuse me. It's okay. Hmm. Scott, well, I mean, Scott, over. this is really fabulous what, what Catherine's talking this about. This is perfect for Concagua. This is a great, yeah. great match, great mix. You know, but it's, it's not just one building because I, I suspect yeah. it's going to have a seed effect. You know, I, I, like I said, doing. all around Mother Waldron Park, I was looking at an image, you saw it at the meeting, where they had six-story buildings, seven-story buildings all around Mother Waldron it was a perfect fit. It was it was that urban as that sort of European piazza feel, outdoor space, with with buildings with with shops and and artists <clears throat> you know galleries and, and and then up above would be residences. It would be a perfect uh, perfect match for Concaco. You know you're going to laugh at me, but th what what this brings to mind is ready, Catherine Montmartre. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Montmartre in Paris. I'm happy just oh, with yes. uh, Greenwich, oh, yes. Greenwich Village is enough for me. Parts well, of let Brooklyn. Me, let me finish my story about the, the process because I think artists would be very curious to know how that works. <coughs> um, so when the artist is asked to come to this peer review meeting, re interview, and ask to show a body of work and show that you're actively engaged in that work. We, we don't jury the work. There, this is not a judging of quality. Uh, that I, that's, was one of the things that was really important to me with Artspace, that they did not judge work, that you know, artists are judged every day, and it's a tough, tough life to be an artist in our culture, and this is not about are you good enough as an artist to be in. It's are you passionate about what you do? Is this how you define yourself? Yeah. So they once they so they show a body of work, talk about their work, we ask questions about their work, how long have they been doing it, what are their goals, how are, you know, what's their process? And then we talk about what's it like to live in an art space project. How do you respond to somebody asking you to turn down the noise? How do you 
how, how do you respond if somebody next to you is making too much noise? We talk about that a little bit, about cooperation and communication and how you all need to get along and figure out how to be creative together and still respect one another's privacy and respect one another's need to work. Then we talk about the community outside the building. What kinds of volunteer work have you done? What kind of project would you like to initiate in this community? So it's, it's about a conversation that we have. And sometimes some of the folks that come in, they're, they're, you know, they're, this means so much to them to get this, this affordable space and to be in a creative community that you know, we just kind of try to be very gentle and warm and engaging because it's a scary process to feel like, even though we say you're not going to be judged, there's still that feeling of, am I gonna get in? Am I gonna make it? And you and we do have long waiting lists yeah. for our projects. But you but you you will set a standard and there'll be others who emulate you and you will you will actually seed the can you know the growth of art because if somebody comes, you know, right in the middle of Kakaako, I want to ask you where exactly this is, right in the middle of Kakaako and says, I, I support art. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to give you a life in art, make it po possible for you to spend your life doing your passion. Then, you know, what happens is a couple of things. One happens is a lot of, a lot of kids, people, you know, they, they want to do art now. Whether it's in your project or not, they're, they're, they're stimulated by that. The other is that other developers might be stimulated uh, to do similar things and follow similar procedures. So what you've described is really could be a tremendous cookie cutter. But let me ask Scott. Scott, what's your reaction to this? Uh, how do you feel about what Catherine is doing? Well, it, it's long overdue. I, I applaud it totally. I think I just think it, it's a recognition in society that artists are very special and that they actually need uh, they need a little bit of subsidy. Um, and I like the IRS approach that you are now a 501c3. You can go out and solicit uh, donations and uh, they are tax deductible. That's the way in which society needs to subsidize and, and, and foster artists because we all know it, it's just brutal. To, it's virtually impossible to be a full-time artist uh, in, in our society. And uh, Kakako is, is just too expensive and yet this is our chance to create, as we, we talked about before, this new urban neighborhood that's a different kind of Hawaii. It's a different kind of Honolulu. But uh, I, I like your, your analogy that uh, kids growing up will see this and say, oh, wow, there's actually a building where I could go uh, when I grow up and be an artist. And that's, that's a revelation. That's, that's new anywhere in the country. So that's exciting. Um, I'd like to comment on that. Um, something that we're looking at here in Seattle is, you know, we're all very familiar now with LEED certification mm -hmm. and how important the, it is for a building to be built with sustainability in mind. One of the things that we're starting to look at and that we've, we've really discovered with so much displacement of the arts and artists and arts organizations and the struggle they have is what about a certification, a cultural certification, that developers could get um, you know, a good housekeeping seal of approval by setting aside space for artist housing or setting aside space for an arts nonprofit or creating some artist studios in their buildings. I think it's, it's me, I'm hoping that's what catches on, that that developers start seeing that this kind of project creates so much activity. What about creating a stack of artist spaces in a building or bringing in some of that kind of creative energy to their projects? Some sort of a tax credit, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. you developers get- Or, just, or just a rating. Uh, you know, you, can, you get affordable yeah. housing. It, I, I understand the, the pitfalls of trying to lump this in with affordable housing because we have a lot of affordable housing uh, projects in Kakako, but they are just strictly affordable. There's no, uh, there's no ingredient right. about art. So I, I, I think that's it's a it, great concept. It has, it has to be tweaked, but uh, why not? You know, one thing, uh, you know, in our show last hour, we're almost out of time. We are out of time. Um, is that you know we're having this this new new neighborhood this new culture yeah. developing right in our midst it's remarkable to 
have the opportunity for that, where the city and all the elements and all the vectors and all the interest groups all somehow contribute to it. And then you watch it emerge and, and you see what things, you know, what characteristics will be, you know, will define this new culture. One of them we know is food because food has already existed in Kakako. Mm -hmm. And of course, food is important in Hawaii. But I think clearly we have established, uh, not only today, but when we had Vicki Takamini on the show uh, a little while ago, and, and we had her at a luncheon program, uh, I think last year, clearly art has a big place in this new culture. So thank you for making that happen, Catherine. And I hope we can talk again soon. And I'd like to introduce you in person. I'd like to meet oh, you I would in person. Love that. To yeah. Scott. That would be wonderful. Yeah. This has been fun. Thanks so much. So one last question is where exactly is the project? The project is a, on Waimanu Street between Kamakei and Ward Avenues, directly behind the Pacifica condominium residences. Okay. That's so interesting because that yeah. used to be the home of the Hawaii Opera Company, um, Hawaii Opera Theater, which did a regular performance of La Boheme. Of course, it's La Boheme. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. Very nice. Catherine Thanks. Vandenbrink of uh, Artspace and, uh, and Scott Wilson of the AIA. Thank you so much, both of you. Aloha. Aloha.